How many people does it take to move a megalith? And how many for how long would it take to build a site such as Stonehenge? And is it even possible that Neolithic cultures have built megalithic sites? If there is any place in the world to get this data set, then it's the amazing remote island of Sumba, Indonesia, the world's last practicing megalithic culture. That is, they still quarry, they move, and they build megaliths by hand. And the purpose of the move is to build a dolmen-style tomb for a deceased relative. The more powerful or affluent the deceased, the bigger the megalith. When I saw this video and a couple of others like it, and all the links are in the description, I headed to Sumba to get a real world data set to answer these questions. of that effort was just to move the megalith about three feet and square it up on the back of this truck. If that's the manpower required to move three feet, is it possible Stonehenge stones were moved by similar methods for hundreds of kilometres? They are similar weight and they are similar shape. It might just seem a bit much that Neolithic or Mesolithic humans living in small nomadic groups could organise themselves to get this data set, we travel to Sumba and talk to the elders and the administrators, the keeper of these historic records. And most of the moves that we used in this data set are actually quite old. Because most of the modern day moves are only done by hand onto the truck, then the truck moves the megalith, then it's moved off the truck by hand. So this is still an important data set to see difficulty. How difficult is it to move a 30 ton stone down a one meter vertical drop, such as this video? but we wanted greater distance to get a more reliable average. And although the data sets are mostly from between 1950s to 1990s, we actually found a method of checking the validity of the numbers, but I'll get to that a little bit later. And in the next video, I'll address why academia always implies or flat out states that moving megaliths is easy. I'll also talk about the main fallacy that they make, the linear relationship between weight and difficulty, and unfortunately the likely reason that they continue this narrative. Because I can't imagine anyone seeing these videos and immediately thought how easy it was to move megaliths. I'll even touch on the more, let's just be honest, utterly idiotic academic theories that are promoted. But that's in the next video, so please subscribe. So for now, the real world numbers, moving megaliths on skids or rollers. The largest megalith we found in Sumba was this 70 tonner that came from a quarry about three kilometers away and took about three months to move. That's an average of about 30 meters per day. And I've put the pins in the description and the sites with some KMZ and some pictures are on my blog. So you can just double click on them and it'll open up and you'll see each site and what they look like. I've also put in the contact details of a local guide. If you do get a chance to Sumba, it is a magic place, no tourists, well worth the trip. So this megalith took 5,000 men, three months to move the 70 tons, three kilometers by hand, just skids and rollers. For a 50 ton megalith, it took 2,700 men to move about 1.5 kilometers and it was in about five or six weeks, again, about one kilometer per month. For 20 to 30 ton megaliths, we did have more data as some of the moves may have been more difficult than others. But if we take the minimum number of people, we can see what the minimum amount of people would be to move the megalith of that size. And it fits an exponential curve. That is the relationship between weight and difficulty is not linear. It looks like a curve, about a doubling of manpower for every 75% increase in weight is a pretty good fit. The interesting thing about this data was that all of the larger megaliths, without exception, took about one month to move one kilometer, some a little more, some a little less, but fairly consistent. There was also tales of stones that moved great distances in the past, but we couldn't actually get accurate timeframes for these moves or in fact verify where the quarry was. So I've left them out of the calculation. The smaller megaliths of Sumba, about one to five tons, are often moved very quickly, sometimes with hundreds of people taking turns at a very brisk walking pace. 
So in this video, I'll just assess the larger stones that are similar in size to the larger stones of Stonehenge. This is of course a very big problem already for the orthodox Mesolithic or Neolithic builder hypothesis. This is because it's widely accepted that at the time Stonehenge was apparently constructed, only a handful of people lived at the Stonehenge site, not thousands. Even in the later phases of Stonehenge, the numbers of people who lived at the site are only a hundred or so. And yes, I'll address the 40 men can pull 40 tonne nonsense in the next video. So next we need to calculate how long it would take 2,000 men to move one of these stones. As the rate of the move doesn't really change between 15 tonnes and 70 tonnes, that is, it's about one kilometre per month, the largest stones of Stonehenge were quarried 32 kilometres away. It would take 32 months, or over two years, to move one stone from the quarry to the site. As there are 75 of these stones, it would take these 2,000 men about 200 years to move the stones. And some of the stones are smaller, but even for a 20 ton stone, the rate of movement was exactly the same. Now, this is certainly problematic for a few reasons. Firstly, all of the megaliths of Sumba are moved on formed roads. So this number, this calculation we've made of 2000 men taking 200 years is if the small groups of hunter gatherers also had machine compacted roads, which they most certainly didn't. And I haven't made a mathematical formula to try to factor in this increase in time, but I can give a real world example. This picture perfect 10 to 15 ton stone in Wee Patundo, and the pin and the images are in the description, was cut from a quarry just 67 meters from the final resting place of the megalith. But it needed to go up a 10 meter elevation change and 20 meters of this move was not on a formed road. This move took 200 men about one month. It was all done with logs and levers. And if you get a chance to travel to this site, it has an amazing hard stone quarry right next to a soft stone quarry on the same site. The soft stone quarry are quarried with a chainsaw. It's a really amazing place. So a 10 meter elevation change increased the time of this move tenfold. How much would a mountain or a river or a marshland increase this by. A tenfold increase in time would be considered an absolute minimum. Secondly, this is considering no time off. No time off for holidays, for injuries, or indeed England's very harsh winters. This calc is for 10 hours a day, each and every day. So is it all possible that some semi-nomadic hunter-gatherers or early stage agrarians organize themselves together for multiple generations to move these monster megaliths, construct this site, then effectively go back to living in bark huts and stone tools for a few thousand years. But the evidence is actually more damning. What exactly did they eat? Because this is a funeral ceremony, the family of the deceased must buy the food for the laborers to move the megalith. So we know exactly the caloric intake of the workers, how much they ate. And as this data came from the family records, it was also a good check of the worker numbers which we gathered from historic records and the tribal elders. And like the total worker numbers, there were no outliers. It all seemed to agree with the labourers' numbers quite well. So to move this 70 tonne megalith by hand three kilometres took three months. And in that time, the 5,000 labourers ate 160 buffalo, 5,000 pigs and over 100,000 chickens, as well as about 100,000 sacks of rice. We were told that this would have included a small preparation feast, as well as the giant festival finale. And this was one of the largest festivals in Sumba's megalithic moving history. Apparently a considerable proportion of the rice and many of the buffalo would have been eaten at the final festival, but the vast bulk of the other food was consumed during the move. And if the numbers sound high, well, they're not so crazy if we break them down. 100,000 chickens consumed over about 100 days is about 1,000 chickens per day. It looks like less than a quarter of a chicken per man per day. That's not such a crazy number. For the 30 ton megalith, which is similar in size to the Stonehenge megaliths, the numbers were 2,000 men move a 30 ton stone one kilometer in one month. 
And in this time they ate 35 buffalo, 500 pigs, 10,000 chickens, and 5,000 sacks of rice. And the reason the numbers are so rounded is that they were buying the chickens and the sacks and rice in blocks of 500. And this megalith is of course smaller than many of the stones of Stonehenge, but again the buffalo were largely consumed at the final festival as well as a lot of the rice. So I feel it's a pretty balanced out comparison. So to compare the Stonehenge move, as each stone moved 32 kilometers, we need to times this number by 32. This would give us the caloric intake to move one Stonehenge megalith from the quarry to the site. And now we can times this number by 75 to get the total caloric intake, or how much food would you need to move the sarsen stones of Stonehenge? 80,000 buffalo, a million pigs, 20 million chickens, 10 million sacks of rice. Even if we drop the 80,000 buffalo, is it at all possible the caloric equivalent of a million pigs or 20 million chickens were hunted, gathered, farmed, for the laborers during the move, because this is not the caloric requirement for the total population of the site, this is just the laborers. This doesn't include the caloric requirement for the other tribes men and women. If this is the caloric intake for the laborers alone, there would need to be at least four times as many people in the group. There would be elders, there'd be women and children, etc, etc. And of course, there would also need to be an enormous amount of people undertaking the enormous effort to gather these calories. And again, this doesn't include the difficulty increase for terrain. These calcs are only on machined formed and compacted roads, remembering the 10 ton example where a small 10 meter elevation rise increased the time tenfold. And of course, no delays for winter, injury, days off, etc. And when we're looking at best case scenario being maybe a quarter of a billion chickens, we also have to remember we didn't include the blue stones. They were moved a total of 20,000 kilometers. And it also doesn't include the actual time for quarrying. And the quarry time frame is enormous. This 15 ton stone took two years to quarry by hand with eight men who had hardened modern metal chisels and sledgehammers while the builders of Neolithic Britain apparently had deer antler. And of course, it doesn't include the actual construction time. This same stone took three weeks to jack up with mechanical truck jacks and position with two dozen men, and it just had to be lifted and lowered with mechanical aid. And remember, as the time frame increases for the quarrying and construction, so does the caloric intake. So how ridiculous do these numbers have to get before we openly and transparently question this Neolithic construction hypothesis. Because I would consider there must be very, very strong evidence that the Mesolithic or Neolithic people built Stonehenge to even consider continuing this as a narrative. So what is the evidence exactly? What is the evidence that makes academics so certain, preventing the broader examination of ideas that Neolithic cultures built Stonehenge? And the answer is, Nothing, not a single item of evidence. There is good evidence that Mesolithic people lived at the site after it was constructed. That is why the theory must include Mesolithic cultures. It can be proven they were at the site after the construction. There are small fires, there's pieces of bone, there's stone tools. Similarly with Neolithic cultures, they certainly lived at the site after its construction and why wouldn't they? I'm sure just like every culture in every era that has come across this amazing site, they would have marveled at its beauty, possibly rebuilt parts of it if they had the manpower and capacity to do so, and they would have embedded it into their myths and wondered at its true purpose. But they didn't build it. This is why academic articles increase in truly perplexing nonsense rhetoric. Because if it was not easy for a few dozen people to build Stonehenge, then they may need to reconsider the same flimsy evidence for all of the world's megalithic construction. This is because Stonehenge stones are not large in megalithic standards. In fact, they're very small. And the following same math undertaken for the difficulty in moving a 40 ton stone, the manpower required, the caloric intake, it puts a huge question mark over any megalithic site. 
And as a final clip and a bit of a precursor to the next video where I'll assess the academic claims, this is UCL's archaeology department pulling a one-ton stone. They moved this one-ton stone with 10 people about 10 feet. It is a tiny megalith moved a tiny distance and they make some outrageous claims from this. One of those is that Stonehenge stones could have been moved with as few as 40 people. 40 tons, 40 people, and it should be easy. In comparison, since I'm not an academic, I live in the real world, this is a real world example. Our calculation from the graph would suggest 2,000 people would be needed, not 40. Well, this is 400 people and a massive truck moving a 40 ton stone up a two meter rise. Let's see how easy it is. Enjoy. <laughs>